so we're here to have a, a lively discussion, stroke debate, of uh, one of the most interesting and important issues um, affecting, I think, the world economy and the world because of the interaction of climate change with uh, energy, probably the most central, in my view, the most the central economic uh, and uh, civilizational challenge that we are now confronting. So I think this is a fantastically important discussion. Before I introduce the, the discussion, uh, and above all the participants and the issues, um, we have got some um, questions. Uh, which are up on, one of which is on the screen, and I hope that at least if you go to the, the place, uh, your, the, uh, the, 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 um, the location that you're supposed to go to, wef.ch forward slash ask, you will get the other question. The questions are, we're going to, uh, you're going to be asked to answer those questions at the beginning and at the end, because I want to see if the, di the discussion has changed anybody's mind. Uh, so the first question is, given regulatory and market changes uh, now underway, should energy companies and investors be planning for a post-fossil fuel fo future? And you have a yes or a no. So you should, if you've got the, your devices, you can uh, uh, go to uh, and answer this question. And the second question, which I hope will be there, but if it isn't, well, so be it, is, is, is deep decarbonization of the fossil fuel industry possible? And while you're all voting, so we get the, the baseline for this discussion, let me very, very briefly indicate what I, how, what I see as the issues we'll be discussing uh, after I've introduced everybody. So uh, I will m go to my left. Um, first on my immediate left is Tina Jomat Peterson, who is the Minister of Energy of South Africa. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. To her left is Patrick Bouillonnet, who's Chairman, Chief Executive Officer and President of the Executive <coughs> Committee. A lot of jobs. Uh, it's the same. It's the same. <laughs> of, of Total. It's the same 27-hour job. Uh, of Total. Um, of course, very well known. Uh, to, uh, to his left is Cristiano Figueres, uh, who is Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and of course played an enormous role in the COP21 negotiations in Paris, which were completed successfully, to some people's surprise, last December. Uh, oh, ye of little faith. No, no, no. To her <laughs> left, based on evidence, but to her <laughs> left uh, is uh, Kenneth Hirsch, who is founder and chief executive officer of NGP Energy Capital Management from the United States. And finally, to his left is Enrique Ochoa Reza, who's chief executive officer of the Commission, I'm going to pronounce it terribly, I apologize, Federal de Electricidad of Mexico. And I think everybody can work out what that is. <laughs> um, so we have a, a good representation of people, of experts. Now, where are we? Um, well, first, uh, the world has committed itself to some remarkably ambitious climate targets with the, the aim in ideal circumstances of limiting the increase above pre-industrial levels of uh, temperature to no more than one and a half degrees centigrade, which given what's already happened is a very ambitious target. Today, according to my very recent research, I think this must be roughly right, 87% uh, of all energy, commercial energy consumed in the world comes from the fossil fuel industry, so it remains overwhelmingly dominant. And it seems to me as near certain as anything could possibly be that if you look at what's happening in the world, that the demand for commercial energy is going to rise a lot. Uh, because there are a great many people around the world, and there are people here from countries uh, very much involved in this um, who will want more energy. And of course, emissions have been rising and continue to rise um, f uh, until very, very recently. Last year seems to have been a pause, but basically have been rising consistently while we've been talking about it. So the question for years, we talk about de de decades, and I've written many columns pointing out that actually it's, as it were, hot air so far. So the questions then are, can we bend this curve? How can we bend this curve? And will we bend this curve? And 
what would all that mean for foss the fossil fuel industry? Should we see it as a di dinosaur? Are some of its assets are stranded now? Or is it part of the solution? And if so, how? Those seem to me the questions we are addressing. I hope we've got the answers to these questions that you have just given. Uh, can you see? Uh, can you see what those answers are? Okay. Uh, oh, well, that's fascinating. Mm. This is, I think, a very carefully self-selected audience. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, yes to the, we should be planning for a post-fossil fuel future, 80% to 20%. I don't think I've ever seen such a result in, in the, such an audience. And the next question uh, is, a, ah, that is interesting. So, uh, uh, we think it's going to happen, but we're not completely sure how. So, we, but the main implication that I would take it is that since you can't deeply decarbonize the fossil fuel industry, given the skepticism, that it's sort of over. Um, that must be the implication I would take. Maybe I'm missing something. So that's a fascinating baseline. You'll all have an opportunity to vote again after you've heard the discussion. So I'm going to start now uh, with Ken Hirsch. Each participant will just to frame it. Each participant will have three minutes to set out their view. We'll have a discussion among ourselves for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then I'm going to go to the floor. You're going to have be, make, make you ask questions, uh, and I might, and I'll see how the first two examples go. Allow one or two sentences of comment, <laughs> but if we get speeches, it'll stop immediately. Uh, but it is a debate, and it would be nice to see, you know, if somebody has a point. Uh, I'm prepared to listen, but only if you can make it in really two or three sentences. Okay, Ken Hirsch. Okay, uh, to, to hit the point head on, first as an investor, uh, which is my perspective, has been investing in the oil and gas industry, the whole value chain for about almost 30 years now. Um, at the outset, I'd also make the case that uh, people in the fossil fuel industry aren't necessarily anti-climate, okay? There is a responsible way to develop hydrocarbons and it's a balancing act because so much of the economic growth in the last century has been on the backs of cheap and reliable and plentiful energy. So now we want to add clean to it, and that's gonna be a, an ambitious target. Um, and so I'll speak from an investor standpoint. As you said, Martin, number one is that global energy demand will rise. Uh, estimates uh, from the sources, even at Paris, is not between now and 2040, um, energy demand will increase about 35% globally. And even though the percentage market share of the non-fossil fuel uh, sources will increase, in aggregate, the fossil fuel, oil, gas, and coal units of production will all increase, even though the market share will go from the low 80s to the high 70% uh, of demand. Hydrocarbons will still dominate being over seven, oil, gas, and coal still being over 70%, almost 77% of total, of total demand. From an investor standpoint, it's important for us to understand that all oil and gas decline. Every oil and gas well declines over time. So we don't have the luxury of thinking in terms of 50 years. There are certain projects like the Canadian oil sands that have very, very long projects measured in decades. But our investment horizons, our investors demand it, it makes economic sense, IRR calculations, everything gears towards, I'll call it a one to a 10 year time frame. So when I'm looking at, at data from now until the year 2040, and I'm seeing that oil demand will grow from 90 million barrels a day, 92 million barrels a day today, to over approximately 105 million barrels a day, natural gas demand will go up 46, 63% on a per unit basis, and even coal tonnage will grow 2%, okay, over that time period. That's 2% cumulative. 2% cumulatively, okay? okay? And so those are very important numbers. They're slowing the rate of growth, which is all important, and that's what, the, that's what this, this whole movement demands, but it's not an either-or situation. And if we make it an either-or situation, the reinvestment dollars that we need to sustain oil and natural gas production, to keep electricity flowing, to keep transportation moving, and those are two separate markets, and they're not interchangeable. That's very, very critical. And so if, if the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater and we stop investing, then we're going to have massive decline rates, shortages, unreliable power, super high prices. And remember, high energy prices is one of the most regressive taxes you can put on a population. So I believe that we, we have to do both, but we can't do it. We can't not increase the investment in fossil fuels simply because aggregate demand is growing. Okay, that's a very clear statement. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the fossil fuel industry definitely has a future, and the future is now, as it were. You have to invest now. That is, I think, the core. So if I may pass now to you, Minister, how do you see this situation from your point of view? 
Thank you very much, moderator, excellencies, and uh, participants. I happen to be the Minister of Energy in South Africa. It's a very difficult position to be in right now. We have the highest Gini coefficient, one of the highest in the world. We have the highest level of inequality. Three million people in South Africa do not have access to modern electricity. 90% um, of our energy comes from coal. Um, we have made commitments, however, at COP15 to reduce our carbon footprint. The past two to three years, we've embarked on a very ambitious renewable energy program where we've bought, brought um, investors on board, foreign direct investors. And most of the investment actually also comes from within South Africa. But the partnership which we developed with the private sector has been phenomenal. So for now, we've brought about 6,000 megawatts of hydroelectricity, wind, solar PV, and um, I, I think it's going very well. 2,000 megawatts have been committed and already connected to the grid. I've just announced a further 6,000 megawatts for renewable energy last year, and we'll do another 6,000 megawatts of renewable energy in um, last year, 2015, 6,000, this year, 2016, another 6,000. Extremely ambitious, but it is the most successful uh, investment program. The investor confidence in the program is very good. Um, we do realize that our reliance on coal will peak until that our profile of the use of coal will pick up until 2020. From 2020, we'll reach a plateau and until 2030. And then with the renewable energy programs coming on board quite aggressively, we'll be the, the dependence on coal will decline from 2030. So um, we, I think we do have a number of challenges. We're speaking of the fourth industrial revolution. I think many of South Africans are still stuck in the second industrial revolution, where we need access to electricity, let alone access to technology. And um, I think that the backlogs that we do face, we are attempting to address. The challenges I also have is the interconnectivity in the African continent. We do not function as an isolated uh, structure. The, our neighbors, Mozambique, immediate neighbors, are dependent on us for energy. So my work is also in the Southern African power pool, right to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I do the Grand Inga. I think you indicated very clearly, Minister, both uh, the immense challenges that a country like you face is given how the difficulty of phasing out coal and the significance of what you're trying to do. I think it brings out the <coughs> dilemmas very, very clearly. Um, and I suppose it's absolutely correct. You are in, in or many of your people are still not really in the second industrial revolution. Um, so uh, that then uh, leads me to Enrique. Thank you, Martin. Well, Mexico's energy reform is promoting a win-win solution. We have to promote electricity infrastructure that it's low in cost and that it's low in emissions. And in order to do so, we're uh, approaching it in two ways. First, we're going to increase our capacity to produce electricity through renewables. Right now in Mexico, 26% of our electricity comes out from renewable technology. Uh, by 2024, we're promoting investments from now uh, till then so that we can increase it to 35% of our mix. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge that uh, fossil fuels are different in their cost and are different in their CO2 emissions. In Mexico, we used to produce electricity in an important way with fuel oil, which is costly and highly pollutant. So one of our alternatives is to switch that into natural gas. So we're promoting investments for new natural gas pipelines. We're promoting new combined cycle plants to use natural gas with top technology. And to do so, we are attracting investments over $11 billion. We will be promoting tender processes this year for additional $15 billion of investment, private sector, national, and international. This energy reform will allow us to achieve two objectives. One, to lower our emissions of CO2, and second, to lower the tariffs 
an industrial, commercial, and domestic level of electricity. We have done so uh, in this 2015 that just ended. We have, in comparison to 2012, reduced fuel oil consumption in the electricity sector by 45% between 2012 and 2015. Industrial tariffs have gone down between 30 and 40%. And actually, an important thing for us is that in comparison with the US, our industrial electricity tariffs, which were 84% 80, higher in 2012, were now in October of 2015 only 13% higher. Our aim is to continue uh, downsizing that reach between the industrial tariffs in electricity between the US and Mexico so that we can become more attractive for productive investments. Thirdly, we need to decarbonize our budget, our national budget. President Peña Nieto's fiscal reform aims at that. We depended in our national budget at 39% from oil resources. Now we do it at 19% after Peña Nieto's fiscal reform. So at the end, it's a three-level change. First, energy reform that allows us to produce more electricity renewables. Second, to swift from fuel oil to natural gas. And third, a fiscal reform that allows us to depend less in oil resources for our national budget. Thank you very much. It's an interesting overview, and we'll come to the implications very soon. If I may ask Patrick Poyane, your yeah. view. I feel guilty here. No, I am the fossil fuel representative. Uh, no, to answer to the question, I would have answered yes to your first question. Maybe it could surprise you, Martin. Yes, but it will not happen overnight. Uh, there will be no big bang. We have to be realistic. The transition towards low carbon energy mix will take time. I would like to stress three points, since I have three minutes. First one is that remember that the mission that we have as energy companies is first to satisfy the growing energy demand of the world in an always safer, cleaner, and affordable manner. And that put the question back to energy efficiency. Uh, and the second is to contribute to the fight against climate change because this event in Paris is a huge event. All the countries of the world recognize there is an issue, and so we must take that as a must for all of us, including for myself as chairman of CEO and oil and gas company. <coughs> when I look to the future, maybe I cannot plan for 2100, sorry, Christina. I try to embark my company looking to 2040, which is a little far, but 20 years. What will be total in 20 years? Mm -hmm. And what I put on the table, everybody in company is, okay, let's, let's look to what is a scenario of an international agency compatible with two degrees. I have to have a strategy compatible with two degrees. It has been decided in Paris. What I observe there is that first, the demand should always, only increase by 10%, 12 exactly, only 10%. Compared to a natural scenario, the business as usual scenario, which is an increase of demand of 50%. Mm -hmm. So the first huge challenge for all of us is energy efficiency. efficiency. Keep that in mind. The second is what is the energy mix in 2040? Renewables are there, solar and wind, for 10%. It's 1% today, 10%. So there is clearly a growing market, but it will be 10%. Fossil fuels are there as well, but only for 60% compared to the 87. I am in the two degree scenario, eh, which is aggressive. I don't know if we can reach it, but we, I take that as a basis. And there you have coal diminishing. Oil is declining compared to today, compared to 2020, which is a peak. And gas is growing in 2040. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that's the image that I take on, on, the, on the table. In front of that, first I would like to stress second point that we don't have all the technical solutions today to come to such a carbon energy mix. Innovation is absolutely of essence if we are serious about it. We need a tremendous amount of innovation. For example, in renewable technologies, there is still a lot of things to do to make them more competitive. I know that we are all Today, enthusiastic about it, we are big solar investor. There is still a lot of things to do if we want to be competitive, in particular at the price of $30 per barrel. It's not a good news, I can tell you. The second field of innovation, energy storage. Because if you want really to get rid of fossil fuels, you need a huge increase, a huge innovation in energy storage capacities. And it's difficult. Third example is 
carbon capture, mm. utilization, yeah. and I insist on utilization and storage. Mm. Because if we want to be net CO2 emitter in 2050, there will be fossil fuels produced. But we want that to net it. Yes. And I insist as well as on utilization, because we speak a lot about storage, we see the limit of that. Utilization maybe is a field where we could innovate with yeah, chemistry, just, chemical yeah. companies. What can we do with CO2? We can capture it. Can we do something with that? So innovation. And then, of course, for companies like mine and my colleagues, uh, let me be clear, we are, our products are responsible, or partly responsible of climate change, but I'm fully convinced we are part of the solutions. We are in the energy fields. We understand these topics. We have engineering. We have the financial capabilities. I would also remember to the investors that uh, the private oil and gas companies represent only 30 to 40 percent of the market. So there is room for investing in private oil and gas companies because 60 percent to 70 percent of markets are national companies. Remember that. And oh, what is my, my strategy? It's quite easy. You will have low, less oil, so I have to invest in assets which are competitive whatever the price of oil will be. So it's a made curve approach, which is the only good approach, by the way, when you are in commodity business. So investing today in all assets, which will be high, high in the cost made curve, is probably not the right strategy. That's why I began to divest of some of them last year. Second, you need to promote gas. There is grass which grow. So gas is clearly, for me, the transition energy. You know, energy. Remember, 300 years ago, it was the wood. Then we go to coal. Then we go to oil. We will go to gas and renewables. All that is a transition. So I'm not afraid about stranded assets, by the way. I'm not afraid. You know, Shayamani told one day it was not the end of the Stone Age because there is a lack of stones. <laughs> there are, coal, we will not develop all the coal on Earth. We will not develop all the oil of coal of Earth. For example, for me, it makes very little sense to invest today in R&D, in, uh, I don't want to make a, a mistake. It's not shell oil. It's oil shell. Oil shell, I think, in English. Because this is stranded for me. We don't, we don't need this type of thing. So, and then natural gas, and then renewables, because it's a growing market. So, of course, it's a diversification. It's not because I am in oil and gas that I'm, I, have, I know what is solar industry, but we have to be serious about it. It's part of the evolution of the energy mix. So I want my ambition is total to be a, still a leader in 2040. So I need to, to, to make a strategy in the wave of this energy mix transition. This is all what I will say. So that raises lots of fascinating questions, um, which we will discuss in a minute. Christiana. Well, there are many surprises today, right? The first surprise was uh, how the audience responded. The second surprise is that, Patrick, your response to the first question. And the third surprise is that I actually coincide with much of what Patrick has said. <laughs> so there's, together, maybe we spent too much time together. <laughs> oh, you have an influence, you know? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Um, so um, three points on uh, from my side. Um, not, uh, you know, not, not surprisingly. Technology, regulation, and finance. Uh, from the technology point of view, I just want to carve that out into what I would call three sectors. The first is um, technology for electricity, right, because that is completely different. Um, and I would say there, it is really astonishing how renewables are coming down and outpricing some of the very, very carbon-intensive uh, fossil fuels. And, you know, the last prices that I heard Three cents uh, kilowatt hour for wind in Morocco, three cents kilowatt hour for solar in Nevada. I mean, you know, what more is possible? So, you know, very, very, very important uh, the outpricing uh, for energy. Second sector that I would put in, and that is for grid connected. Second sector, very important, is renewable energies for access to energy. Very important in our half of the world, in the developing world, because we do have 1.3 billion people without electricity. And the versatility and the diversity of renewables does seem to be much more appropriate for that kind of market. And the third um, sector has to do with transportation, and that is the uh, the, the competition there to uh, to oil, and I would say, you know, that's probably the one that has least momentum right now. However, there are three factors that are affecting the future of the mobility uh, industry. 
One is certainly what I would call the u Uberization or the shared economy. The second is uh, the tendency toward electric vehicles. And the third is the tendency toward self-driving. All of those coming at the same time, and I would say probably put in, putting a pressure down on the demand for, uh, for oil. So all in all, I would say big picture from the technology perspective, a very interesting uh, future for, uh, for renewables. Secondly, uh, regulation. Well, Paris, a very, very clear example of international regulatory framework that many held to be completely impossible, um, some even just 12 months ago, but, you know, miracles do occur, uh, and I'm always in the market for miracles, so we, here we have the Paris miracle. We do have a very, very serious regulatory framework that is going to be in effect not just now, it's not a flavor of the month, it actually is designed to be in effect, in effect for several decades. And and increasingly so, because that is the international regulation, but it will demand that national regulation keeps pace and, in fact, increases in its, uh, in its aspiration to continue to decarbonize the economy every five-year period, so increasing uh, pressure on that. So on regulation, both international and national. And my third point, why I think uh, that renewables are actually currently underestimated, Ken, in your, in your numbers is uh, the financial risk. Um, I, I hear what you said, but I also hear Mark Carney. Uh, I also hear the Financial Stability Board. I also hear the G20 saying, tell us what the risk is. And Mark Carney coming out, governor of the Bank of England, not, you know, not, not exactly a, a Greenpeace member, uh, coming out quite clearly and saying, wake up, because this can be the most disastrous systemic risk that we are facing, and we don't want to get to what he calls the jump to distress. So, you know, I, I think the financial markets are beginning to, uh, to understand that. So my conclusion, Martin, is um, that we are very much in a transition. Um, I would say that we're looking at, if I had a crystal ball, uh, I would say that we're looking at a transition period of X number of years in which there's going to be a coexistence, in particular, of the two dominants, I would say, gas and renewables. And that coexistence, hopefully, helping each other out, not coexisting in silo to each other. And how that would, would be done, I leave to Patrick, because that's your, your bailiwick and not mine, but you, you understand uh, the picture. And finally, let me just uh, say this. I, I'm very, uh, very concerned about the decarbonization. I noticed Patrick also reacted to, you know, uh, are we going to get to deep decarbonization? Is it not the moment, as I just said a few hours ago, to begin to change our language? This is not about decarbonizing. This is about increasing the carbon efficiency of the global economy. That is the, that is the, the task that we have ahead. And that then begins to point toward the solution. For example, energy efficiency needs to be there. For example, the very, very intensive carbon fuels need to disappear and are disappearing. But those are the kinds of tendencies that you then actually incentivize if we begin to think about the fact that what we're doing is improving the carbon efficiency of the economy and that we will have to extract out of every ton of CO2 that we will emit, we will have to extract much more value GDP. Okay, um, let's ask, let's follow up. There are lots of differences, which we will now try and tease out. I'm quite interested, I might have not heard it, but I don't think I heard the word nuclear. Uh, and uh, I thought that was that's quite interesting. So I'm gonna, I, if I may ask you first, since you come yeah. from the country that is prop, was it in there? Was it no, in no, no. It's not. I mean, I mean, it's not in my solution. But I think but nuclear. Do you is, think? It, yeah, that, do people think that mm. in the, that if we are so to try and get a plausible future in which we might be able to reduce massively the role of fossil fuels? Do the members of the panel no. think nuclear plays a large role or not? No. It will uh, increase. It will increase. It's again a year by 3%. But there is a limitation to nuclear, I think, which is a security of nu nuclear security. And so there is a place. But clearly, marginal. But in the, in it this. cannot be the, the solution. It's part of the mix. I'm a, I, I will not invest because it's a specific 
industry, and you cannot do everything, but I think there is a room for that. But it's raised many questions, in particular of security of the world system. So, um, uh, but yes, there is a room for that, for sure. Does anyone else want to comment specifically on the role of nuclear in this new future? Though you, that, you'll get your chance later. Uh, we, at the moment, we're stuck with the panel. Um, if I may, just for a little bit longer. Um, I'd like to follow up with what you said, uh, because I want to tease out the implications uh, of some, because I, to get the, the differences clearer. I, the way I read what you're saying is really and truly, given the technologies we now have, okay, we might have innovations into some completely new future which make uh, renewables work as base load and all the rest of it, given the demands, we are going, despite the fossil fuel shifting that is going on, we are going to end up under any plausible assumptions with rising emissions. Uh, and, uh, and that's necessary if we're going to meet the world demand for energy. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think that the um, people miss, they, they don't appreciate the scale of the energy industry globally. Over the last 100 years, the world has invested over $60 trillion and took 100 years to get where we are today. We can start on trying to find that next generation, that leapfrog. But I think getting distracted on small little things, which are important locally, the distributed power and flexibility in the emerging markets to connect people and give them electrification, which is the, one of the single most uh, valuable things you can do for economic development is to electrify a, a part of the world or a part of a community. And I think we have to go after the big stuff. And the big stuff is oil, natural gas, and coal. And so are we going after that in the developed world where we're going to have two times the number of cars on the road? We might have three times in sort of percentage market share the number of hybrids and electric vehicles from 5% today to 15%. But there's going to be two times the in billion. In the developing world. In the total world. In be, the total world, There'll be sorry. a billion more cars and trucks on the road. In the United States, there's 250 million cars and trucks on the road. If you took 15% of the cars off the road and made them natural gas, natural gas demand in the United States would go up 10%, and the price of natural gas would skyrocket, and oil demand would drop, and so the price of a gallon of gasoline would drop even further. There's been a dramatic demand response, and in the United States alone, in one year, we've increased our driving by 4%. Okay, 4% in one year is about a half a million barrels a day, and it's happened, if you give Americans an extra dollar a gallon, we know exactly what to do with it. We buy, we buy an SUV and we go out to dinner, okay? And the top three selling cars in the United States are trucks. And the average miles per gallon of the new fleet of cars has gone down, despite all of the, of the emotional attachment to renewables. And there has been truly emotional um, attachment that this is, this is something we need to get on with. But at the end of the day, cost matters. So and that's, that's, that's and, what I can't get over in the so short term. So, Christiana, basically what they're saying here is, yeah, we, the, the governments of the world in beautiful Paris under pressure signed up to all sorts of stuff, but it, they didn't really mean it. And, the, and in fact, one of the best way indicators that they, that they didn't mean it, which in fact I pointed out, is they haven't done anything to increase taxes as oil prices have collapsed. Or maybe one or two, I bet most countries haven't. So effectively to consumers, oil prices have collapsed and this is going to lead to precisely the disastrous consequence from our point of view. So it's actually, actually far from the fossil fuel industry disappearing, uh, um, it's, it's going to expand. And world population going from seven to nine. Yeah, of course. So how would you want, and I'd be interested in others' view. I think actually an even more aggressive criticism uh, to governments is, well, then if you're really serious, why don't we have carbon price? Right? I think that would be, you know, just to take your point, that you know, one, be, step, uh, one indeed, step farther. Um, so and it's, just, it's just window dressing. Well, I, I, I would say that probably isn't. And there are two governments sitting here. Yeah, I'm going to come. To that. Uh, you know, two governments sitting here who I, I really, you know, would, would question whether one would say to the government as well, you know, was it just fun that you were having in Paris or was this serious? Uh, and are you really willing to submit yourself to the scrutiny and the accountability of every five years coming to the world back and saying, here's what I did. Did I progress or am I regressing? Um, and I'm not saying, Martin, that this is going to be a, 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 a straight line, right? 
right? I'm not saying that at all, because economies change, because conditions change. So this is probably going to be, you know, like, like the temperature, that it goes up and down and out. But there is a very clear tendency, OK? There is a very clear tendency here toward increasing the carbon efficiency of the economy. It is not going to be straight in any country specifically, and it is not going to be straight uh, globally. But the tendency, it's a, it's a little bit, you know, like the difference between not being able to differentiate between ebb and flow and the undertow, the other, the current. Let's look at the current. I'm absolutely clear that there's going to be ebb and flow. Minister, you wanted to respond to this question. I absolutely agree that uh, we're not going to be able to do renewable energies as the main energy um, uh, provision for our energy mix. And that is why we have carefully agree with you that we need an energy mix. We are one of the countries which also decided that part of the energy mix will be nuclear energy, particularly because of our water scarcity. You've seen that we've had, we are having a serious drought in our country. We need um, gas and nuclear for desalination, not just for energy. But um, we know that uh, right up to 2020, even to 2030, our dependence and reliance on hydrocarbons is going to increase. And we'll only be able to plateau out after about uh, 2030, around about this. Our time frames are more or less the same. Um, but for us, it's about access to energy, access to electrification, not only in South Africa, but in the rest of the African continent. Our agenda 2063 with the AU is about integration and ensuring that there is industrialization in the African continent, and um, we cannot do that without renewables. The sun is a resource which we have. It's a resource which is an, uh, there. Of course, we don't have the storage capacity, but we do believe that that technology will be available shortly. And yes, well, Mexico, absolutely. Mexico will definitely accomplish its compromises to reduce CO2 emissions. And we have been working for that even before Paris was signed. Yes. And we started working for that with President Peña Nieto's energy reform by substituting fuel that is highly pollutant, like fuel oil, which is 68% more pollutant than natural gas when you uh, transform it into electricity. And by doing so, I was mentioning before that we have reduced 45% our uh, use of fuel oil in three years. That has uh, been equal to reducing 42% of our CO2 emissions in the, in the power sector. So we're moving towards that goal in the energy sector altogether. My colleague Emilio Lozoya from Pemex is doing the same thing in its refineries and petrochemicals. He's swifting from uh, fuel oil to natural gas. Now, that's a contribution. And the other end of our contribution and commitment is to increase our renewables. And by renewables, it's not only wind and uh, solar. It's also hydropower plants and geothermal plants. Uh, one part of the energy reform is to increase our production of geothermal energy by uh, establishing 13 new fields. And on the other hand, we will continue increasing our capacity to produce hydropower uh, through, through hydropower plants. We discussed about storage. And one of the important elements of storage is not only batteries, but it's also the way we use our hydropower plants. In Spain, elsewhere in Europe, you have reversible uh, hydropower plants. You use them when the prices of electricity are low to bring water up back to the dam. Yeah. And then when the prices of electricity are back up, you use it again. So you establish different mechanisms to promote and use better your natural resources. So I believe that the mix is there. Nuclear energy. <clears throat> Obviously, there are countries like uh, France that have 50% of their uh, uh, power mix uh, with nuclear. Other countries like Mexico have uh, only 2%. So there are different solutions, and there are different technical solutions to different problems. And I believe that a, a, a fair mix of energy shall include nuclear, and it shall be established with the highest standards of security and efficiency. Can I just follow up one question with you, and then yeah. I know you want to make a comment. Um, I mean, what I'm hearing here, if one takes a sort of optimistic view that we're going to get uh, somewhere with this, with the results of Paris, is that there is going to be a, a, a fossil fuel future, and indeed it's com consistent with your own argument, but it's increasingly a natural gas future. Um, so that raises the question that uh, Ken, Ken raised, which is, 
uh, the economics of gases against other fuels and what we do to indicate to bring about this shift. Is, do you see your company as essentially a gas company uh, by 2040? Uh, do you think that's what the fossil fuel industry will really be by that time? And will coal we, have we largely gone? We will have more gas than oil, I think, you know, just because the market of gas market will grow and because the oil market will diminish. So it's just a, a market story. But there are conditions, and I fully agree with what was said and by your answer. Let's be clear. If we do nothing in terms of carbon pricing, we will have plenty of coal. That's the reality. That's the economical reality. India will develop coal. South Africa. If you have, don't have the right signal in the market that you put in the price of energy the cost of the climate pollution, if I count the CO2, there is no way. And this is a real question for the global economy because it has a cost. And the energy is one of the key factors for the future growth of the world. So this where you are right, it's a question of, or that's the question of, one of the words we use is affordable, and people want affordable energy. And we are designing a world where the energy could be more costly, which raises a lot of questions in terms of energy growth, and in particular vis-a-vis -vis the emerging countries. By the way, you know, if I answered you as CEO and chairman of Total to your question on nuclear, as citizen, I think if we are all serious about it, for India, the solution if you want India not to develop its coal resource, it's nuclear. But who will pay the nuclear for India? Where is it? It's not solar. I praise, I, I admire my minister Modi with solar plan, but it's not enough because you have 1.5 billion people who don't have access to energy. Solar could be done, and we have, pro we have a program. We develop a program of low-cost solar lamp that we distribute in Africa in particular because we have a, but all that, all that is, link, is, is totally linked. These energy are linked. We cannot disconnect. So we will have fossil fuels and we will have renewables. We cannot play once against the other. This is clear that we need to get, we, we, the fossil fuels which has the low, highest emission is coal. It's, it's a fact. But we need to find the solution to step by step exit that. Carbon pricing is one of them. I'm going to go to the floor now. I'm going to take three or four comments, uh, well, questions, if possible questions. You have a burning comment, but you can do it in two sentences. You don't need to justify it. You just make your point. Uh, and then I'll see if we should go back to the panel so we have an interaction between the others to send you. Uh, I've got, this is a strange position I'm in with people behind me, so I, and I don't, haven't yet evolved eyes in the back of my head, so I'll do my best. So uh, is there a microphone or, uh, no. So we'll start here. Uh, question and or incredibly brief comment. Yeah. Uh, say who you are. Lars Josefsson, I'm, I'm the chair of the Forum's Council on Decarbonizing Energy. Okay. And You're the guilty party. I'm, well, have, have the party with the solution. Yeah. So, and, uh, but I will make a brief comment on that. I, be, I believe, truly believe that the uh, route to our sol solution of this problem is electricity. We need to decarbonize electricity as soon as possible. And in order to do that, we need decarbonized baseload power. And uh, w nuclear was mentioned before. I totally agree with Patrick if, if you address it to the generation three, the present generation, or even the generation three plus. But the next generation, generation four, is a totally different, I, I would say that has the potential to be a real game changer. And that can be available uh, commercially in 10 years from now if we want it to be. And that we put in our, in our, uh, in, in, in our work in the council. I would also like, like to say the other alternative. I think you've exhausted your. Yeah, I, the, the other alternatives is, is actually using CC US, uh, or you can also use sustainable biomass to get base load power. I have, of course, a lot of other things. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Unfortunately, for some reason, they didn't put you on the panel. Uh, uh, the gentleman here, please. Uh, could you bring the microphone, please, to this gentleman? Uh, please say who you are. Khaled Alereza from Saudi Arabia. I just would like to remind everybody, the objective is to reduce carbon emission. And we have not addressed the biggest issue behind carbon emission, which is deforestation. Deforestation accounts for 
more carbon print than car, airplanes, boats, train, everything you can think of in the transportation. So I'd like Thank to Thank you very much. This. Very good point. I'll take one more comment or question. So, uh, uh, lady here, please. Yes, ideal. Suited. Right next to the percent. microphone. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jane Burst, and I run the Climate and Environment Department at the National Physics Lab. And I just wanted to build on the comments around carbon pricing and specifically ask Mr. Hersher, does your uh, model uh, that you use for investments include any carbon price? If not... Uh, how would you justify that, given that there's emissions trading schemes in countries representing more than 50% of global emissions and c carbon taxes in many other countries as well? And at what point do you think the carbon price would need to be reached in order to um, change the IRR for your projects? That's it. I'll take one final question. The, the gentleman behind there, and then I'll go to some other quadrant of the room. Um, Please. Thank you. I, my name is John Mark. I'm chair of the Future of Electricity. I have a specific question. I also am a regulator by background and training. Um, the specific question relates to how much the present low prices of oil will affect the growth of renewable energy in the immediate future and potentially depending on the state of the oil market in the future. So we've got some very good comments questions. Um, there's a question directly to you, Ken. Uh, so I'll get, start with that. Um, do you allow for a carbon price, a possible carbon price in your projects? And, um, and what, would it ha what would it have to be to really shift what you do? So, so it's a very good question. One of the, one of the, the investment markets are, are responsive. So today, one of the biggest problems globally is that carbon is treated uh, unevenly around the world and inefficiently around the world, and in some places it's not. And so as, as takers, that would be a tax. And so we... we look at tax rates wherever we're investing, and so that would be a tax. And if it's there, we factor it in. If it's not there, we don't. We make well, what, if, what if it might if be it there? Might be there we You've actually, got a 10-year horizon. Sure, we, in a 10-year horizon, we would look at some, sorts of, some sort of sensitivity on it. Um, but in the present value equation, something that happens in year 10 really gets drowned out in this time frame. I, I, I want to emphasize something that's really that I view as sort of a little bit of an inconsistency in the way we approach things. I totally agree that natural gas is the single bridge that can take market share from coal. Okay, we're talking about electricity, so it's not about oil. Okay, so today's low price of oil doesn't really matter because electricity is what generates the CO2 primarily, and the big the big base load power is coal. And so the only real viable thing we could do today would be natural gas. And one of the principles coming out of Paris was we need to peak emissions as soon as possible. Okay, so I would go for the low-hanging fruit immediately. So my question is the IEA estimates Paris to get the INDCs approved or, or through would cost $13 trillion. And as you wrote about, Martin, this week, the emerging market capital flight is going to make a lot of this money unavailable. Okay? For $1 trillion in about 10 years, we could, we could replace all of Chinese coal with natural gas-fired power plants. And it would cost a trillion dollars. Okay, it'd be the biggest trade finance deal done between the Siemens and GE and whoever else wanted to get involved. Okay, and for $1 trillion, we could do it. And then we could leapfrog once that's taken care of and you could eliminate 20% of CO2 emissions right there. And China would love it. It'd be the biggest trade deal for the, that we could announce. Now, that, would, that, is a, that is actual math. Now, but getting 196 countries together is important, I think, for the next 50 years or 75 years. But right now, about seven countries matter. Okay? And those seven countries produce 70% of the emissions. Mm. And, and the lowest hanging fruit is Chinese coal. American coal has already gone down significantly because of natural gas. Natural gas in, from Texas is fueling Mexico's gas development. Better. So we like the market. I get the point. Okay. And we, like, I want to, does anybody want to come back on nuclear at all? No, or I just wanted to maybe to answer to you. Uh, we made a lot of studies on that. At 30 to $40 per ton, you change the picture very efficiently. You don't need more than that. At $30, $40 per ton, you, you have a lot of mechanism. First of all, gas becomes competitive against coal in many scenarios. And it's a level where you begin to really have an influence on innovation. Because the costs, and people today, when they speak about $100 per ton, they are wrong. It's just a static view of technology and the capacity. If we mobilize innovation, $30, $40 per ton, it's largely enough. So it's not a huge amount 
when you impact of cost of energy. We, people are afraid by carbon pricing. Immediately we see if we want to store carbon, we need one hundred dollars per ton. It's wrong. It's a static view. And in this world, we are creative, we have innovation, and we demonstrated that in the energy field with Shell or with Shell Gas. Shell Gas was not existing. Mr. Hirsch tells you we have the solution in the US today. But 10 years ago, we had no solution. So technology is, is a key. And again, it, don't afraid people about carbon pricing by raising big figures. It, it will be dynamic and it will solve the problem. Can I go to deforestation, which I do think is an important issue? Christiana, would you like to comment on the... Well, they're, they're, that, they're, that, that is a huge challenge which we're really not addressing at all. There's two comments to that. First, right. that it is 20 percent uh, of the emissions, uh, and so it needs to, to be managed, and Paris covers it. The other piece that is very often underlooked, overlooked is that the way Paris is looking at climate neutrality is it is looking at both sides of the ledger. It is looking at reestablishing an ecological balance between the emissions that we will have to, to put out um, and the absorptive capacity of the planet. So we have actually two levers in our hands, right? We can bring down emissions and we absolutely must increase the natural capacity of the earth in addition to CCUS technologies that is not the natural capacity it's the man-made capacity but the natural capacity is also at our hand and can also be used does anybody want to Tom comment further on what the current low prices of oil are likely to do oh. and the way people are responding how serious uh, because it's it, obvious. It, it's going to okay. Go ahead. The, the answer is obvious. It's very detrimental for any uh, policy. Let's be clear. I, I hear since last six months that there will no impact. It has an impact. You know, people are rational economically. It's they are acting. The investors are are people who are economically rational. So today at thirty dollar per barrel. Sorry, but. I am a big investor in solar, and I was advocating that there are 20 countries in the world where we could make solar profitable today. It's not true today. At $30 per barrel, there is not, not a single one. Sorry. And, and so this has an influence, including on energy efficiency. You may, we made huge efforts in the last 10 years in energy efficiency because energy was expensive at $100 per barrel. So this is connected. You cannot avoid it. Can I come in on a counterpoint with that? Yeah, wait, wait. Because is it not true, Patrick, however, that at the same time, this low price is actually taking out very, very expensive and difficult to reach uh, oil and gas off the table. So you're taking off, you know, Arctic drilling, you're taking off deep water, you're taking out sour gas, you're taking out all of the very much more expensive mm -hmm. categories of, of you're, you're taking them off the table, or at least delaying them. So I think it's working on both sides, is it not? I, I think it's, it's not the price we take off. It's just what my, my remark about Merit, merit curve, cost merit curve. For me, Total has never thought that it was a good idea to drill in Arctic because it, it cannot be profitable, whatever. It's, the cost is so high, but it is stranded. Uh, but it's not linked to the $30 per barrel. It's just that when you need to spend $500 million to drill one well, let it, it's better to leave it in the ground. Leave it in the ground <laughs> and use your money more efficiently. We are there to be efficient economically. Well, we're, whatever else, low oil prices are reducing waste and inefficiency. We seem to agree on that. Uh, and if, Enrique. And if oil prices are going down, well, natural prices are going down. And if you compare it with uh, carbon, then you have two sources of electricity that are low priced. One is highly contaminated, one is less contaminated. So then you have a choice to switch from carbon to natural gas or from fuel oil to natural gas. So it affects the switching, but it also affects the energy intensity overall. Exactly. And on the in other the hand, direction. if we see renewables only as solar and wind, we're missing, I think, other elements of renewable energy that are very helpful for uh, different countries. Hydropower plants in Norway, Brazil, Colombia, or Mexico are very relevant, and they are still very competitive, even with low prices of oil or natural gas. On the other hand, geothermal resources are also very important, and they're affordable. Okay, I'm going to, unless you want to come in, do you want to come in now? I'd like to take just two or three more questions, but if you wanted to respond, I'm welcome to like that. I think that uh, for us in developing countries and the entire African continent, low fuel prices have unintended consequences, but they also have a positive impact on our economies. So countries like Nigeria, um, Ghana, they're facing huge problems with their the fiscus, 
And um, whereas it worked, the low fuel prices worked for us. Mm -hmm. Not if you're Nigeria. <laughs> um, no, for South Africa. Of course. I'll take three more questions if I can. If you're unbelievably short about the question, does anybody else or comment? I, sorry, I couldn't see. It's yes. dark there. Yes, please stand up so the mic, yeah, the mic, mic will get to you. And please be very brief because we're running out of time. Uh, my name is Paul Wright. I'm a director of the Climate Institute and Energy Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. Every day I work on battery storage technology with a very large group of people. Uh, my colleagues nearby work on the catalysts for carbon capture, utilization, and storage. I know these technologies well. The ramping of those technologies measured over time is much less than we would prefer. <laughs> As scientists, we try and do our best, but it's a very complicated technology. I would just like to get the panel's comments on that comment and urge them not to clutch at those two things like carbon capture and storage and battery storage is the big opportunity in the future. They're there in the future, but the ramping is slower, and I'd like the committee to comment on that. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, another comment or question? Anybody? Exhausted yet? The gentleman at the back there? Please stand up so they can find you and say who you are. Hi, I'm Marco Dunant uh, from Mercuria. A very simple question. Since uh, the Paris Agreement, um, are, you, are you, is the panel aware of what happened to carbon prices? Went up. Hmm? Okay, if you don't, it went from $8 to $6. So obviously the market doesn't believe in the agreement. that that we have to sort of try to work on that to make sure that the correct pricing of carbon sort of uh, comes into the equation. Okay, um, I think I'll have to, one more, perhaps one more. Um, I'm going to be very, is anybody else? No, you, no, no, you, I don't think that's fair. Uh, anybody else? Is there anybody else who wants to ask a question? Okay, then I will give you one more, but really brief. We know who you are now, so you don't need to say. Thank you. Um, so uh, assuming that we're going to do this vote again at the end, we, I just wanted to give uh, Patrick the opportunity to change people's minds about that second question and talk a little bit about the work that the WEF Oil and Gas Climate Initiative is doing on Futures of Methane. I did not understand the second question. Futures of methane. No, the, question, of me the, question. the question, I did not understand it. The, uh, decarbonizing yeah, fossil fuels is impossible. <laughs> there are carbon there. And I hate the word decarbonizing. I never use it. First, okay. first time. It's a wrong word. I feel, it's a wrong word. I cannot use that. No, I'm a carbon industry, so I cannot use that word. You forced me to use it. Uh, methane, methane, carbon. yes, it's, a, it's one of the big topics on which we need to work. I think we can work on that by technology. So it's very high on the agenda. I can tell you we have created a club. By the way, we had a lunch in Davos today with 10 CEOs of oil and gas companies dedicated to climate change. And this story about methane technology, of can methane technology, methane is very high on top of the agenda. It's even the first topic to tackle. Because there we think that it's on our hand. It's our technology that we manage. So we need to address it, and we need to target. And in total, we are thinking to have a target of emission less than 0.5%, so very, very minimum. And we think it's quite not far from being reachable. Can I, 10 seconds to anyone who wants to reply. De depressing comments on the future of uh, carbon capture and storage and battery storage. Uh, anybody wants to respond to that? Ben. Very quickly. The $13 trillion to do all of the things that Paris laid out, in my opinion, is so excessive for countries and companies that don't have that kind of capital. Take the low-hanging fruit, do it for less money, and invest the extra money in the leapfrog technologies that can take big market share at a moment's notice. The small little changes, I would say to the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they could, whatever is convenient, whatever is cheapest, go do that because millions of people are dying because they're heating and cooking with dung. And they need to electrify, okay? Whatever it is, go do it. It won't matter to the climate. Let's tackle the U.S. coal business, the Chinese coal business, the big, big movers. Christiana, the yeah. price of carbon has fallen from $8 to $6. I don't know which emission system that is, but that doesn't matter to me. Uh, so the, the, mar no, the market doesn't believe in your agreement. 
Well, I, I think you know That's the, the last word. By yeah, the way. carbon markets have been sort of an up and down, and and very much uh, still a work in progress. Uh, I I don't think that that the price uh, in carbon was actually a reflection of Paris. It's been a, a very much of a seesaw, uh, and I think again you have to take the the long term view, uh, and it's not uh, the price uh, uh, that kind of a price on carbon out of those few jurisdictions that are currently putting out a public. It's actually the much deeper price on carbon. Uh, uh, that uh, that is we will be seeing soon for example coming out of China and then out of all of the other jurisdictions okay we're now going to vote again uh, thinking very carefully about what's been said and what it implies so for the first question is given regulatory and market changes should energy companies and visitors be planning given think about planning horizons for a post fossil fuel future so that's the first question and the second question, which we have just been told is not a question, is, <laughs> but I thought carbon capture and storage is supposed to do this, but we're not going to get into that debate uh, now. Uh, is deep decarbonization of the fossil fuel industry possible? Obviously, one answer is it's inconceivable. So you, those are your questions, and let's see what, where we are now. I think we were 80, 80 20, and 57, 43 in the 40, first. 42, 40, 52, 48. 52, 48. We lost one. Yeah, I would say. We lost well, one. No. Well, we didn't do a much, good job. Not much. Okay, well, that's, I still think that you're ludicrously over optimistic. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but that's. Oh, uh, uh, to me. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so they, uh, this, there has been a modest shift in the direction of maybe this isn't going to happen, but the general view still remains overwhelmingly that the fossil fuel industry. Uh, in the longer term, doesn't have a future. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I thought, think quite amazing in in Davos. I think if we had did this ten years ago, the results will be have been very, very different. It may be because we're all collectively mad, but it's a very interesting result. I'm not going to summarise the discussion, except I think the lesson to take is this is all going to be very economically, technologically, commercially, and politically difficult. And anybody who doesn't, haven't got that really in their minds hasn't been thinking about the problem. That's all I want to say, and thanks very much Thank for attending. You. It's been great fun. Thank you.